Well, thank you again for coming tonight. Um, it's lovely to see everyone. What we're going to do on the last Friday of each month, God willing, we're going to have this kind of meeting where it's a more kind of in-depth uh, study of the Bible, looking at this passage uh, in the book of Revelation from chapter 1 to chapter 3. And uh, the format, as I've just uh, said, is I'm going to have some teaching and then we're going to have questions and answers, well, hopefully some answers and maybe some questions. And we trust that God will bless our time together and that we'll be a prophet uh, to us all. The book of Revelation is a very difficult book uh, to understand. It's one of those books that we dip into and we read through sometimes. And it's quite frightening, a lot of it. And a lot of it is quite confusing. It uses imagery and symbols. And so it tends to be a bit of the Bible sometimes that we avoid because we think, well, it's just too complicated and it's too difficult to understand. Well, it is a difficult book. And I think we're going to read chapter 1 in a minute, but I think that's why right at the beginning it says, blessed is he that reads this book. So that it might be a book that uh, naturally we might avoid or might find difficult. But we're encouraged right at the beginning to keep reading. Uh, I think that if we try and get the big picture of the book of Revelation, uh, it helps us. The details are a bit more difficult for us to understand. However, somebody said that books of the Bible, the key is always right at the door. And so you'll find in the opening chapters or the opening few verses, the key to the book is there. And I think that's true with the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 19, we're going to read it in a minute, says, Write the things, the Lord Jesus says to John, which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So we can divide up the book like this, and this is just a very quick introduction. The Lord Jesus says to John, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be Hereafter. So there are three sections to the book of Revelation, just briefly. First of all, there are the things which thou hast seen. Second section, the things which are. Third section, the things which shall be hereafter. And so here is how it's divided. The things which thou hast seen is the vision that John sees in chapter 1. So the Lord Jesus appears to John in this vision and he says, John, write down the things that you've just seen. And that's what he does in chapter 1. And then the things which are really covers chapters 2 and 3 because John is instructed to write letters to the churches in Asia. And these were churches that existed at that time and conditions that existed at that time. And we're going to look at that in more detail during the study. And then the section from chapter 4 right to the end of the book uh, really deals with the things which shall be hereafter. So there are three sections. The things that they've seen, the vision of chapter 1, the things which are, the letters to the churches, and then from chapter 4 on, you have the things which are to come. It's quite interesting, if you read the beginning of chapter 4, you'll see that John begins chapter 4 by saying that there was a door opened in heaven, and he had a voice saying, come up hither. So until chapter 4, he's on the earth, John. And he's looking at things on the earth. But then in chapter 4, he's invited up into heaven. And from the rest of the book, he's going to see things from God's standpoint. And what a panoramic view he has as the future unfolds like a scroll from chapters 4 right through to chapter 22. So, we can say that the first two sections are to do with Christ's government in the churches. The things that you've seen, the things which are. And then chapter 4 to the end is Christ's government in the world. I believe that in the age in which we live, God does not intervene in judgment on this earth. In other words, if the economy plummets, it's not because God is punishing us. It might be the result of our own folly. If there's some big natural disaster, God is not punishing that country. Because we're living in an era of grace. The only thing that God intervenes in the world in at the moment is in mercy and love and grace. And we're thankful for that. But people say, why doesn't God do something? God is going to do something. And chapter 4 onwards really recounts what happens when God steps in. And so the first section of the book from chapter 1 to 3 is about 
The Lord's authority in the churches. Chapter 4, which I suggest you begins after the church has been removed. Chapter 4 to the end, it's Christ intervening and government in relation to the world. Uh, In this series, we're going to think about this first section, Christ's government in the churches, chapter 1 to chapter 3. So let's read Revelation chapter 1. And that's all we want to do tonight. We want to look at Revelation chapter 1. So if you can turn your Bible, please, to Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to see that there are three parts to this chapter. Uh, And this is what the Lord refers to as the things which thou hast seen. The things that John just saw in the book of Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, I'm reading the authorised version, verse 1. The Revelation. It's a, it's a funny thing that people in the world often talk about the book of Revelations. <laughs> and uh, a Christian was saying to me the other day, I get so annoyed when people talk about the Revelations. It's not the Revelations, it's the Revelation. It's, it's singular. It's, it's, it's not the Revelations as though there are lots of these Revelations. It's one Revelation. So verse 1 says, The Revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. And here's the key. Here's the, here's the encouragement, sorry. Blessed is he that readeth and they that keep the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Verses 1 to 3, that's the kind of introduction to the book. And then from verse 4 down to verse 8, here is John's greeting. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. So that's the greeting section. And really this verse, (coughs) verse 7, really... um, shows the whole theme of the book of Revelation. It's the coming of the Lord. And verse 8 finishes it off with the Lord saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, we don't have a lot of time tonight, so I'm not going to deal with the first eight verses. We're going to deal with the next section. So here is John now in verse 9. I, John who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, the word is lampstands, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the breast with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen. This is our key to the book. The things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be 
hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Amen. So in this chapter we have the introduction, the greeting, and then we have this vision that John sees. And we're going to concentrate on that vision tonight, just for a few minutes. Before we look at the vision, let's just think about the writer and the recipients. John. Well, John at this stage is the last survivor of the apostles. Uh, I think history indicates at least that all the other apostles had been martyred. They all died violent deaths. There's only one apostle who's going to die a natural death, and that's John. And John possibly is in his 90s at this stage. And the interesting thing is, you remember the Lord Jesus said that if I will that John stays alive until I come, what is that to thee? He said to Peter. So in other words, he's saying, I might come in John's lifetime. And it's quite interesting that the Lord let John live on for so long after the others had gone. And no doubt people would look at John and say, well, he's not dead yet. <laughs> the Lord might come in his lifetime. Of course, the Lord didn't guarantee he would come in his lifetime. But he said, if I will, what is that to thee? In other words, it's possible that I could come in John's lifetime. So here he is, this aged man. That's a very good likeness, I believe. And uh, this aged man, and he is an exile on the Isle of Patmos. You can maybe see the map there if your eyesight's good. You can see Patmos in the Aegean Sea. Uh, just uh, down at the south there, that dot in the, in the blue sea. He's on this island, he's been exiled, separated from other Christians. You know, I'm sure this often happens in the Bible, doesn't it? That, that the devil seems to think, I've got them now. He put Paul in prison, he thought, that's it, I've, I've locked up the best preacher. And then he gets the last apostle, he says, right, I'll exile him to Patmos, I'll put him on a rock in the middle of the sea, and that will do great damage to the cause of God and Christ. Well, Quite the reverse, because they could never isolate him from God. Uh, listen, isn't it wonderful to think that we might be isolated from other people? We might feel we're on our own, but we're never alone, because uh, even in his exile, John had this wonderful revelation. And so John is told to write, and it's interesting, just before we leave John, that John writes history, theology, and prophecy. He writes his history because he wrote the Gospels, uh, or his Gospel, sorry, John's Gospel. And then he writes theology because he wrote letters, three letters uh, in the New Testament. We've got them preserved. And, of course, he writes prophecies. So a wonderful figure. We don't have time really to talk more about John, but I'd love to talk more about John. What a wonderful man he was. And here he is. John gets this wonderful vision. And we uh, discover that he's instructed to write to the seven churches uh, in Asia. And they're all marked there on the map from Ephesus, Ephesus sorry, down to Laodicea. Uh, they're all um, in that area which we now know as, I think, mainly in Turkey. These are the churches that John is writing to. And John, there's a letter, we're going to see this in the next few studies. There's a letter for each church, there's a letter for Ephesus, a letter for uh, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, and so on. But John is instructed to send the whole book to each church. So if you think about this, John is sending out seven copies of the book of Revelation. And they're going to each church. So every church, here's the church at Smyrna. They get their letter, they're the church at Smyrna. This is specifically for you. But they get the other six letters as well, and they get the whole book of Revelation. Because God wants everyone to know this. Every Christian, every church has to get this message. And so seven copies of the book of Revelation have been sent out. One, two... Ephesus and Smyrna and so on, right down to Laodicea. We'll come back to these things later on. But that's where we find ourselves. John, exiled to Patmos and now instructed to send these letters to the seven churches. Let's think about the vision he saw. And there are two elements to it. We'll have to move very quickly. One is the lampstands. The other is the Lord. There are two parts to the vision. He turns round. He hears this voice behind him. He's in the spirit in the Lord's day. And he sees, first of all, lampstands. And then he realizes there is somebody walking in the middle of the lampstands. So let's just think about these lampstands and think about the Lord tonight. The lampstands, we're told, this vision of the lampstands, they stand for the seven churches we've just been talking about. I want to just say a few things about this because this is very important. First of all, the location. 
It's interesting that these letters are not sent to the churches in Judea. They're not sent to the church at Jerusalem. I think the church at Jerusalem was a big church. Not sent to the church at Jerusalem. Initially, at least. They are sent to churches which are in Asia. And the reason for that is quite simple. It's because during this age, the vast majority of Christians are not going to be Jews. They're going to be non-Jews. They're going to be Gentiles. In fact, uh, in the book of the Acts, uh, I think it's Peter who says that God is taking out of the nations a people for his name. So in other words, not out of the nation of Israel, although Jews are being saved. We're thankful for that. Of course, they always will be. But the vast majority of Christians are from non-Jewish nations. And so it's significant, I think, that these seven churches are selected and they're in Asia. They're not in Judea. They're not in Palestine. They're not in Israel. They are in Asia. The number of them is significant as well. There were more than seven churches in Asia. Uh, We know for a fact that there were at least ten churches. There might be far more than that. But we, we read of ten that we know about in that area. Some of them are not sent these letters. But these seven churches are selected for a good reason. We're going to think about We'll come back to that in a minute. But just bear in mind that this is not just all the churches. He's selecting some churches. And he selected seven churches in Asia. Uh, notice, please, the form uh, of this image. This is not the menorah. You know what the menorah is, the seven-branch lampstand. This is not what this is at all. Uh, You see, the background to the book of Revelation is not the tabernacle. If you go back to your Old Testament uh, history, you know, in the tabernacle, the tent they built going through the wilderness, there was the lampstand with seven branches. It's a symbol of the state of Israel. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, that's not the background of the book of Revelation. The background of the book of Revelation is the temple that Solomon built, where there were multiple lampstands. And so it's not an idea that there's one lampstand with seven branches coming out of it, but as I think was shown in an earlier slide, there are seven independent stand-alone lampstands. There's something very significant about that. You see, we're going to discover in the next few chapters that these local churches, the churches in Asia, are responsible directly for their actions to the Lord and to nobody else. So there's no federation of churches. Uh, There's no headquarters. The headquarters is not in Rome. It's not in Jerusalem. It's not in Edinburgh. It's in nowhere on earth. These churches are responsible directly to the Lord. And so the Lord takes each one to task and says, you're doing this wrong, and you're doing that right, and I commend you for this, and I criticize you for that. They are responsible directly to the Lord. Dear friends, that's exactly the pattern of the New Testament church today. You know, we like to organize things. We have a hierarchy, we have a board, we have a, we have a synod, we have a kind of hierarchy of a structure of organization. That is not the New Testament church. The New Testament church is groups of believers in each locality Gathering simply as they understand the scriptures to teach, responsible not to any organization on earth, responsible directly to the Lord. So let me just use a a very uh, local example. What happens in the local church that meet in this building? The elders are responsible for that directly to the Lord, not to anyone else. So we have got folks here from Culloden, uh, folks here from Ullapool. Uh, we're not responsible to the folks in Culloden for what goes on here. And uh, the, respons- the Culloden folks are not responsible to us, of course. We're all responsible directly to the Lord because these lampstands are independent, individual churches that are responsible directly to the Lord. And then you think of the composition. Did you notice the golden lampstands? That tells us <laughs> their value to God. You know, we look at each other and we get fed up with each other. Well, maybe we don't. Uh, but, uh, but we tend to see the worst in each other. And we we, we criticise each other sometimes. But let's just remember this, brothers and sisters, that every Christian is someone for whom Christ has died. And God places a value on the lowest and the least in our eyes, Christian. And so these lampstands are golden lampstands. They're precious, they're valuable to God. And, of course, their function is to dispel the darkness and to shed light. And that is the function of the local church in any locality. 
We sometimes sing the light of the world is Jesus. Well, in a sense, that's true. But the Lord Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But then he said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. And so we've been left in a very dark world uh, to be lampstands. Now, let's just come back to the seven. Why are these seven local churches picked out? Well, we must say that these letters address the needs of seven literal local churches. So that Smyrna, uh, Sardis, Thyatira, they were all churches existing at that time. And these letters were written to them, we're going to see in chapters 2 and 3, to address the needs that they had at that point. So that's a very literal reason. But secondly, seven is a complete number. Uh, That's why time is divided into seven. There are seven days in the week. God created the world six days, seventh day he rested, and then there was a new beginning. The next day was the next week. So God has divided time up into sevens. Each seven is a complete thing. Seven is a very important number in scripture, as you know. Seven talks about complete. And so what we've got here in these seven churches is a complete picture. And some suggest it's a complete picture of local church conditions. In other words, uh, if you read through the letters to the churches in chapters 2 and 3, you'll find that there's hardly a problem that would ever arise in any local church that can't be addressed in these letters. It, 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 it's a great range. You get churches that are suffering. You get churches that are lukewarm. You get churches that are going on well. Churches not doing so well. Different problems. You'll find the whole range of experience. And so some say it's like a handbook for the churches because it's a complete picture of everything that can happen in a local church. There's a sense in which that's correct. There's something else I just want to point out. We're not going to spend too much on this, but some believe, some theologians believe that this seven church uh, grouping is a panorama. It is in itself a kind of prophecy. It's a picture of the entire church age from the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 right to the rapture when the church is taken away. And let's just think about that for a minute. I want to put this up. It's got a lot of detail. You probably won't see that very clearly. Can you read that at all? The church age timeline. So what this, uh, this isn't my production, but it illustrates what we're talking about. So you've got Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. The church is all on the top. You've got their features. For example, Ephesus is the apostolic church. Smyrna, persecuted church, and so on. And then down below, this uh, scholar has indicated indicative dates through the church age which seem to correspond with the conditions of these churches. I hope that's quite clear to everyone. So, for example, the Ephesus church, that seems to indicate the period just after the apostles had gone, the apostolic church. And the the thing about Ephesus was it was quite correct, but they'd lost their first love. And then you get Smyrna, the next one. Uh, Smyrna is the persecuted church. It's the only church that's never condemned by the Lord. And After um, the apostolic age, you might say, there was a great period of persecution. And then you get Pergamos, the married church, when there's this unholy alliance, I would say it's unholy anyway, of the church and the state. And Constantine converted, in inverted commas, and, and the church became a very powerful thing. It became wedded to the state, and it became very corrupt. Thyatira, the pagan church, Uh, The rise of uh, idolatry within the church, the Roman Catholic Church, the scholar has said here. Sardis, there came the Protestant Reformation. That's what they're suggesting here. And yet, with the Protestant Reformation, there was a deadness as well. There was outward form. Uh, Protestant churches, a lot of them didn't know the reality of salvation, although the the Reformers certainly did. And then somebody was asking me the other day and said, all these talks you've been given about revivals and so on, it all happened in the 1800s. What was so special about the 1800s? Well, it's a very interesting thing. The 1800s were special and the 1700s were special because there was a worldwide evangelistic movement, uh, not confined even to the West, but there was a worldwide movement of uh, opportunity to spread the gospel. And so this scholar has likened it to the Philadelphia church, where you've got the Lord saying, I've set before you an open door and nobody can shut it. And then sadly we come to the last one, which is Laodicea, which is the apostate church, which is exactly where we are today, where professing Christendom has adopted the standards of the world. 
and turn their back on the word of God. We can see it all around about us. And so I suggest to you, this is a very interesting timeline, you might say, that indicates that the seven churches might be a picture of the entire church age. We can talk about that later and we can see that as we go through. Very briefly, because I've gone over the time already, let's turn our attention to the vision that John received of the Lord. This is a wonderful vision. He sees one moving in the middle of these candlesticks. Let me just say three things before we go into the detail of this vision. First of all, the churches are important to him. Uh, I was talking to somebody recently who said, you know, as long as you're saved, well, well, let's face it, if you're not saved, nothing else matters. But he said, as long as you're saved, uh, and as long as, you know, you love the Lord, how, what we do and how we meet together, it's not important. You know, there are all these different churches and uh, people get excited about uh, how we should do things and so on. It doesn't matter. Now, I did say to this gentleman, well, I, I said, could I get your Bible, please? He said, what for? I said, I want to rip out a lot of the New Testament. Because <laughs> then you won't need it. Because it's all about the church. So, oh, he, he wouldn't give me his Bible. I wouldn't have ripped it out. Anyway, but, but what I'm saying is, if we think somehow that the Lord is only interested in people getting saved, which of course he is, that's why he died on the cross. But if we think that's everything, we've missed it. Because if, this, if, this, if these chapters tell us anything, tell us this, the Lord is intensely interested in what's happening in your local church. And so that's very important. Secondly, this is a vision of Christ like no other. Because as we read the details, it indicates that he is a priest. That's the, the picture that's coming before us. And, and the, the, the imagery is this, that in the temple, the priests were responsible to go around and they were responsible to trim the lamps and keep the lamps burning, resupply them with oil. Make sure that the impurities were taken away. That's exactly what the Lord is doing in these chapters. He's going around the local churches and he's adjusting here and he's trimming there and he's pouring in more oil here and he's keeping the lamp burning. And that's the whole point. And so it's important we see the Lord as a priest. But also we can see, and we're going to see in a moment, if you just give me two minutes, uh, you'll see that uh, this really is a picture of judgment. The book of Revelation is a book of judgment. First of all, it's the judgment of the churches. And then it's the judgment of the world. And so we're going to see that the Lord is acting as a priest, but he's also acting as a judge. And he starts off with judging his own people. Let's look at this vision very briefly. There are, there are ten things I want to just point out, but I promise you I will not take long to do this. First of all... <clears throat> Notice John turns round, we read this um, in verse 12. In the midst of the seven lamps stands one like unto the Son of Man. That's very interesting. Because John writes his gospel to demonstrate that Jesus is the Son of God. I would be expecting, if I get a vision of, 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 of heaven, I get a vision of the Lord, I, I would be saying, well, I saw the Son of God. John says, no, I turned round and who the person I saw was the Son of Man. That's a very interesting title. We don't have time to go into it tonight. But just remember this. That the person who judges the world is going to be a man. Not an angel. Not even in the sense someone who is divine. He is divine. But the Bible says, in fact, John says in his gospel that the Lord Jesus said that uh, the Father has committed all judgment to him because he is the Son of Man. You remember when Paul spoke to the people at Athens, he said that God's appointed a day in which he's going to judge the world in righteousness, and he's going to do it by that man. And so it's interesting to remember this, that the judgment of our world is going to be in the hands of a man, not any ordinary man, the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus. It reminds us of his humanity. Secondly, we read about his garments. You just read the description. He's got garments clothed with a garment down to the foot. This is the, I'm not sure if it looks very good in that particular illustration, but it's the white garment of the priest that went right down to his, to his feet. And so you have this picture of purity, of uh, sinlessness, 
And so the Lord Jesus is displayed in this way. He is uh, a true man and he is pure and white. Thirdly, he's got this golden girdle. And the interesting thing is that um, the Bible talks about being girt about the loins, round about the waist. Which means if you've got a long flowing robe on in the Bible days, you wanted to run or do some work, uh, you very quickly trip over your trip over your robe. And so what they did, they tucked it up and they girded it around their waist so that they had freedom of movement. But that's not the idea here. He is girt round about the breast, round about the chest, with a golden girdle. It tells us this, that in this case, the Lord, well in every case, the Lord's affections, the Lord's love, his heart, is controlled by gold, which in the Bible always speaks about divine righteousness. So it's this picture of someone who is a man, who is absolutely pure, who loves, certainly he loves, but his love flows along the channels of divine righteousness. And fourthly, his head and his hair are white like wool. Well, uh, you know, my hair's getting whiter all the time, but, but this idea in the Bible of white hair, and there's nothing wrong with white hair, uh, but white hair is supposed to indicate maturity. And you remember Daniel saw this vision, and he saw the, the great judgment day, and he saw the Ancient of Days, the Ancient of Days sitting, and his head was white, and his hair was white and wool. And you'll know that in our courts today, if you have the unfortunate experience, you're up in the court, and you'll discover that the judge is sitting there with a funny thing on his head, and it's a grey wig or a white wig. And the whole point of it is this, that where does that come from? It comes from this idea from Daniel, from the book, from the book of Revelation, that anyone who sits in judgment has to be mature. You can't commit this to a teenager, with all due respect to teenagers. You, you can't give the judgment of people to people who are not mature and don't know what life is about. And so isn't it wonderful that when the Lord comes as the judge and when he judges his people and when he looks into our church, he does so as one who is mature. That's the idea of his head and his hair being white as wool. Verse 5, his eyes are like flames of fire. Perscapacity, isn't that a wonderful word? Perscapacity, that simply means that he sees through. <laughs> you know, we talk about people that they can see through things. You know, you can have a smoke screen, you can have a veneer, you can have a facade, but somebody who sees through things, they get to the truth. That's what the Lord is like here. His eyes are like flames of fire burning through. He knows everything. His feet like brass. Brass in the Bible is a picture of judgment. Why is it his feet? I would have thought that it might be his hands were like brass if he's coming to judge. But it's his feet because this book is all about the coming of the Lord. He's on the move. Judgment is coming. This is the point. And so his feet are like feet of brass. His voice, the Bible says, like the sound of many waters. This is wonderful. I'm, I'm getting carried away here. You've got another four minutes to go. <laughs> um, his voice, like the sound of many waters. The idea here is if you're standing beside a waterfall, and the water is just cascading down behind you, gallons and gallons of water. And you struggle to make yourself heard. His voice is like the sound of many waters. Now they tell me this, if you want your voice to be heard, you can do two things. You can either increase the volume, or you can increase the pitch. If you go higher, you see there's a band of noise. If everyone else is talking and there's a thick band of noise, the only way I can, I can get over it is to go higher. Or if I can pierce through it by being louder. Now, they tell me this. If you're standing at a waterfall, you can shout to you blue in the face. Nobody will hear you. And you can go from the highest range. They say this, that falling water has the complete range of notes. In other words, you can't go any high, you can't go any lower. And what John is saying here is, here is a voice that cannot be ignored that blots out every other voice. I think that's wonderful. You know, we live in a day, brothers and sisters, when our Saviour and his name, and uh, I heard this this week, and it grieves us. It's used as a swear word. And he is ignored and he's vilified. One day he's going to speak and every other voice is going to be drowned out. It's going to be his voice alone, his superiority. In his right hand, there are seven stars. We'll come back to that in a minute. But the right hand talks about strength. It talks about security. Out of his mouth comes two-edged sword. 
This is the symbol of the scriptures, the word of God, and then his countenance, his face is like the sun that shines in its strength. What a wonderful picture. John had never seen the Lord like this before. You remember John was the disciple who lay on the breast of the Lord Jesus. He got so close to the Lord Jesus, and in fact he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. But he'd never seen the Lord like this before. Brothers and sisters, we need to have different ideas about the Lord. You know, the world would pass the Lord off as being gentle to the point of almost weak and, and mild to the point of almost ineffective. And, uh, and we believe that the Lord is gentle and we believe that he is mild. We believe that he is loving. But we must remember, brothers and sisters, that our Saviour is mighty and omnipotent and superior. And he is the judge and he is the one who commands our utmost respect and honour and adoration. Let's think about the effect it has on John. I fell at his feet as dead. I think this is more than just, you know, I dropped down. Uh, I think that the vision of the glorified Christ had such an effect on John that had it not been for the actions of the Lord, he would have died. Because the Lord Jesus puts out his hand, you read it in verse 17, he laid his right hand upon me and said, fear not. And if you read in the Old Testament, again, Daniel, when Daniel saw the Lord, he collapsed. Brothers and sisters, we need to get a good idea of the majesty, the awesomeness of our God. The Lord Jesus says, fear not. And I don't want to spend time on this, but the Lord says, I am the first and the last. I was there at the beginning. I'll be there at the end. I'm he that liveth and was dead and is alive forevermore. Wonderful. I'm the resurrected Christ. And I have the keys. I have total control over hell and death. You know, John is going to see visions that would that make the hairs of our heads stand up. The hairs in the back of our necks stand up. The, the carnage, the death, the destruction is going to be unleashed on this planet. But John's been told right at the beginning, I'm in, I'm in complete control. I've got the keys of hell and of death. And I think we'll just leave it there. I was going to tell you about the seven stars, but I think we're out of time. And uh, it's too difficult anyway, so I'm glad to get rid of that one. But uh, uh, the seven angels are the seven churches. But I hope this gives us some idea. We're setting the scene. And, and you might think, well, what relationship does this have to the next few chapters? Well, it has this relationship. Every time the Lord Jesus addresses a church, he reminds them about this vision. He says, I'm the one who's got the seven stars in his hand. I'm the one who's got eyes like flames of fire. I'm the one with feet like fine bread. He reminds them all the time about what he is like. Brothers and sisters, we need to get back to the authority of Jesus Christ in the local church and understand that we're dealing with an awesome, majestic, superior Christ whose voice should be heard. I remember reading uh, an article on the local church and the title was One Man, One Vote. I thought, hmm, that doesn't sound very good. I don't, I don't like that. You know, things in the local church don't go to votes. Shouldn't do anyway. But when I read on the article, I thought, this is great. Because what he was saying is, there's only one man who has a vote, and that's Christ. There's only one voice that's heard, and that's his. One man, one vote. That's it. It's not, my, it's not what I want to do in the local church. It's what he wants to do. And so may the Lord help us to understand that. We're just going to close in prayer, and then we can have questions and answers if you wish. And we'll have refreshments. I apologize for going over the time, but uh, let's just close now in prayer.